Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm so excited because we have Kimberly Collins on today. She is a coach. She is also a blogger, and she is amazing. She's an author as well, and she talks about today, she's going to actually talk about leadership and transformational leadership and how to be the best leader you could possibly be, and she has some great tactics, tools, and strategies that she's going to implement today in our today's podcast and she's amazing and she also has um her own podcast on our channel and she has she's part of our podcast community so take a look check her out and you're going to really like what you see because she she taps into a lot of great topics that i think are beneficial for any business owner and things that you could even apply in your daily life as well so kimberly it is a pleasure to have you on the show today i'm so excited you know, tell us everybody a little about yourself and what you do. And, and I can't wait to hear about leadership and transformational leadership and how we can go about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Stacey. It's always such a pleasure to be here to chat with you. So like you said, I'm an author and coach and a consultant. And um, I've been a business owner for an orthodontic practice with 35 employees for about 10 years. And so we in our practice, use a lot of leadership skills to help the team um, feel like they're part of a community, but also be pointed in a forward direction. And yeah. um, what I've been kind of writing about recently in my blog um, has been this transfer idea of transformational leadership. So the idea that, you know, we all are leaders in some part of our lives, whether it's, you know, we're a team leader or a business owner, or we're a parent, or say we're you know, part of a friend group, and we um, just want to make a difference with them or, or siblings or whatever it is, we all have that capacity and probably that position of being a leader somewhere. And transformational leadership is kind of that idea of taking the responsibility of being in charge and moving it towards how can we get people to follow us um, in a positive direction. And that will usually come from us working on our own emotional intelligence um, yeah. and the way that we show up for other people. I like that. You know, I think it's so important um, for people to understand what a true leader is, because sometimes people, you know, have the idea of being a leader is the person in charge who tells everybody what they should do and how to do it. And this is the right way. And that doesn't always come off very well. When you work with a, a group of people in your, in your business, you know, you really want them to mentor off of you. They want, you want people to look up to you. People don't like being told what to do. You know, there's always a way you could word things and, you know, everybody has to be on the same page, I think. And uh, you understand what their needs are and them understand what your needs are. And sometimes I find that, you know, a lot of leaders lack communication skills with their employees as well. Absolutely. And emotional intelligence in leadership is really where the workplace in general is moving. You know, you can be someone who can make great decisions. You can um, handle a lot of pressure, but if your emotional intelligence um, needs improvement, that's going to show up a lot with your leadership. And it can really stunt your growth in an organization. You know, uh, organizations are putting a lot more emphasis on your ability to be self-aware, communicate, um, respond instead of react. These are things that are going to um, kind of help you grow or tap you in a certain spot in, in the organization. And if you are already in leadership, it really stunts the growth of your team. Um, you know, the best way that you can create a more harmonious team, a more productive team, a more cohesive team is by working on the leader and having the leader um, create more emotional intelligence so that it trickles down to what we call psychological safety in the workplace. Um, that psychological safety helps the team feel like they can give and receive feedback. They can make mistakes. They can communicate freely um, that they're, they're in a safe place to be themselves and help the organization move forward with their efforts that aren't going to come back at them with gossip or negative feedback or reactivity from the leader or their colleagues. So it really starts with that leader being self-aware and helping it trickle down to the team. 
I love that. Now you, you also talk about transformational leadership. Like how do you go, like explain to the listeners what transformational leadership is, and then maybe you can go through some of the, the steps and the, and the, and the uh, strategies on how to actually, you, you know, transform into, you know, to the person that you need to be. Absolutely. So a, a transformational leadership, you know, this is a term that I'm using to um, talk about a person who is self-aware. They, they know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. They know when they're at their best and they know when they're at their worst and maybe they're going to need some extra support. Um, there's somebody who can take feed and also gives appropriate feedback. And like you had said earlier, knows themselves, but they also know their team. They've put the effort into knowing who works for them. Um, so this sounds like really unattainable. You know, it sounds like the perfect person needs to be the transformational leader. Really, if we start, you know, breaking it down, um, it's knowing where you kind of show up in a negative way. So, um, you know, your triggers, something that activates you into a reactive state of mind. You're not responding anymore. You're just lashing out. Um, it would be in your communication and as well as just kind of self-care as well. But that yeah. triggers is usually the spot where there's the most meat, you know, for there's the most opportunity for growth um, and for creating the psychological safety. Because if you can get yourself from being in a space of reactivity to being in a space where you're responding in a positive way, even yeah. if what's coming at you is, uh, you know, hard or conflict, if you can respond to it instead of react, you're making best biggest step towards creating psychological safety for your team. Now, what are some of the common mistakes that you see leaders make in business that really has an impact on the business as a whole? And maybe some solutions and things that they should do instead. Right. So I'll talk about this triggers part because I really feel like this is where that, you know, um, where the most mistakes and also the most area for growth can be. Um, and triggers are, are it, it's kind of been, co-opted by, you know, popular lexicon of um, saying, oh, something triggers me, something I don't like. But in the Enneagram world, we talk about triggers is something that has sparked messages that hit our core fear. So it, it's something that uh, maybe somebody is saying to us, but our ego is interpreting it as a message of um, attacking our core fear, something that's going to make us re react in a way that is trying to push that fear as far away as possible. Um, right. It can be something like, you know, for one type, if they're feeling like they're getting the message from somebody else, you're unwanted. That is a poor wounding message for certain types. And it will make that person react in a way if they're not aware that that is something that's, that's deep down for them. So these triggers are such a great spot for people to um, really become aware of what's underneath all of the things that they are dealing with on a daily basis. So, um, you know, if a leader understands that they are going to feel triggered if they hear any messages about them being bad or incompetent, or yeah. if they're being criticized for being irresponsible or sloppy, if they can feel that rise of, um, you know, I have to fight this and push it away and not uh, accept it as true, they can they can realize that they're in an activated state and yes. take steps to help themselves get regulated so that they can respond to their team member. Um, I think that maybe the biggest mistake I see team leaders do is say, I want everybody to know what my triggers are so they don't trigger me. And that's mm -hmm. such a great idea. And I don't think it's ever going to work. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, it's, it would be a great thing, but it, we need to be more aware of what is it that's going to make me feel activated, feel like yeah. I need to fight and defeat and push away this message that I'm receiving so that I can respond to my team member. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. and, yeah. Right. And, and some of the ways that we can do that is a little bit of, you know, front end work on ourselves. So really getting to know ourselves, whether it's with the Enneagram or you know, Myers-Briggs or if Colby, whatever kind of personality system that you enjoy, Enneagram really dives into triggers, which is why it's such a great platform for um, this kind of work. But really diving into what is your type? What makes you feel 
activated? What makes, what kind of messages make you feel like you have to uh, defeat it, push it away, get away from it as, as fast as possible and take the time ahead of time to make kind of an action plan. What are you going to do when you start feeling yourself become activated so that you yeah. can respond instead of react? I like that. I like that a lot. I think, I think a lot of people, they, they react and they don't even think about what they're going to say. They just like, they mm -hmm. let their thoughts take control of them. And that's like a big no, no, instead of maybe just taking a deep breath, calming yourself mm -hmm. and really recapping the whole situation and then trying to, you know, even walk away, you know, and then come back and maybe talk about it later or 24 hours later, once your thoughts are collected, I think, and, and you're more, um, you know, you're level-headed and calm and you could actually handle the situation in a, in a better way where it's going to be more on a one level and you're not going to go, go at each other and, you know, cause more problems in, in the workforce. What absolutely. do you think? Oh, absolutely. I think maybe the, you know, the best things that we can do for ourselves is when we feel activated is to kind of take that breath and, let ourselves, you know, ground ourselves in the moment. Usually if we're activated, we, you know, we start being that floating head above a body, you know, we're just, we're so up in the anxiety and um, the pressure of the moment instead of taking that deep breath and really evaluating what is it that you need at this moment? Maybe it's space, maybe it's 24 hours, maybe it's, you know, a moment to just think about it um, before you open your mouth and start saying things that can, you know, in turn activate or trigger the other person, but really right. taking that space, you know, the idea being that if you have the, um, if you have the thought that you need to breathe quickly, speak quickly, move quickly, it's usually the opposite of what you, you know, what you need really need in that moment is to yeah. take a deep breath, slow down the process, really get your your body and your brain back online instead of being in this fear state to be back into, you know, I, I'm here in this moment, I can take a deep breath, can ask for what I need, yeah. and then I can respond. Yeah, because if we're in that fear state, we can't move anything forward. It's just going to be spinning back and forth with the person in front of you. I, I agree totally. I think, I think really taking a step back is so important and, and, you know, being able to uh, just, you know, clear your mind. There are some tools and strategies people can use because a lot of times people, you know, get very emotional, you know, especially in the workforce, people want to be respected. And a lot of times mm -hmm. people feel disrespected in certain situations when it occurs by the way a person might talk to them or how they are treating them. They might feel like, you know, they're not speaking to me on the same level. They're speaking to me like I'm below, you know, mm -hmm. and that causes a lot of disruption and, and problems and, and unstirred emotions. You know, what are some of the things that you suggest that really could be helpful? And so I, I'll say there's like a two-part thing. There's the kind of before everything happens and the during yeah. everything happening. So I would say the beforehand is, again, that diving into what's activating me. The other part of that being what activates my team? You know, when somebody is coming in and re interacting with you and they're in an activated state, if you know where they come from and, and um, who they are and what their motivations are, you are more likely to be able to parse out what is really going on. What kind of stories are they telling in their mind? What's potentially activating them. Not that it won't take the sting out of the disrespect you might be feeling in that moment, but it will at least add a layer of, I think I know what's going on here. It yeah. depersonalizes it a little bit. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't feel wrong to be disrespected, but it takes it from, I think this person is really disrespecting me. They're just reacting. And, yes. um, that can help take your emotions out of it a little bit more. So that's kind of the beforehand. Of course, anything that helps with mindfulness, such as meditation or journaling, just to be able to be aware of the thoughts that go on in your brain on a regular basis. These yeah. are all excellent things ahead of time, help you slow down your reaction time in conflict. So it, you know, it can seem a little 
you know, hard in the moment to make yourself journal or meditate, you know, it's a bit, yeah. it's a busy day, but being able to create the space between um, stimulus and response, that's what we're trying to do. Um, yeah. So then in the moment, it's trying to continue to slow down your reaction time. Um, right. And again, try to depersonalize anything you can depersonalize. So, you know, taking a really deep breath, even being able to take a step back and, you know, what is this person thinking, feeling, responding to in this moment? What kind of stories do I think that they are telling themselves right now? Because usually it's a story, you know, somebody yeah. is reacting to some kind of actual situation. There's like the fact, and then there's the story we tell around it. So it's usually yeah. something that somebody is responding to that. And it's also then asking for what you need. Sometimes when you're saying, you know, I need some space around that. It's so that the other person cools down a little bit too. Um, yeah. So whatever it, you need in that moment to resist the temptation of reacting is going to help the relationship long-term. So yeah. whether that's saying, you know, I think we're both a little heated right now. I'm going to say, let's both take five, you know, write down some goals that we want to have with this conversation and come back. Whatever it is to kind of cool off the emotion Yes. personalize it and then be able to come back with both our brains online without the emotions kind of fuzzing the situation. Right. I like that idea a lot. And I love the fact that you mentioned about journaling and, and different techniques, mm -hmm. just to get those emotions out, because I feel like a lot of times when things happen and you get so hurt, you know, by, mm. you know, something that may occur in the workforce and, you know, how someone may approach you or things they may have said to you or just how they talk to you. A lot of times those emotions stay repressed inside you and you keep in your mm. mind dwindling it over and over and over again. Those people have a hard time moving forward and then really, you know, having that positive impact in their business, you know, because they're focused on the negative things that have been occurring and they can't get it, resolve it in their, in their mind. Absolutely. Our brain is a funny thing. It's, if it's, if it's allowed to spin, it can spin stories that, you know, they don't even have punctuation at the end it's just you know one run on sentence to the next one and then they always do this and it's but if we can make ourselves actually write it down it again helps us be able to distance ourselves from these thoughts the thoughts are not us the thoughts are just thoughts and we're yeah. able to then look at them and maybe make sense of them maybe we say you know what I, I'm seeing that I'm telling myself the story that I'm a victim I have no power here I'm not able to um, make a better decision with this. And really, when I'm looking at it like this, I can see, you know what, I've got yeah. options, you know, I, I don't have to stay in this story anymore. Um, yeah. Or maybe it's just being able to say, I really heard about that. And right. it comes out on paper, and you can look at it and say, I'm really hurt. And maybe I just need a little bit of space to heal. So yeah. really getting whatever is turning and spinning in our brains and putting it on paper um, yeah. can be one of the best ways we can to get what the stories are we're telling ourselves and what's yeah. really going on. Like you said, if there's hurt or there's um, feelings of disrespect, putting it on paper allows us to make sense of it more than just thinking about it. And our brains are yeah. so good at anytime we're, we're thinking our way to a solution, spinning it back in and getting us yeah. distracted. So we always just feel in a state of confusion. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And that's so hard because so many people do have that, that um, characteristic where they keep spinning their brain over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, you mentioned meditation is meditation, a good way to kind of slow it down and kind of get to that level of calmness and then maybe journaling afterwards a little bit and getting that, those emotions out in the open and trying to just mm -hmm. focus on the present, maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know, a lot of times for people, especially if they are, they are business owners, or they have a million things to do, or their parents or their whatever it is, there's a million and one things that can keep you away from meditation. And so when I, when I like to practice meditation, you know, I like to kind of make it this big, broad thing, what feels good for you and your specific brain? Um, you yeah. know, sometimes people feel 
the best with a meditation on a walk, you know, so it being, you know, no music and just allowing your brain to have open space. And any time that a thought comes in, just, you know, just lovingly dismiss it. You know, yeah. sometimes that moving meditation is a better space. Sometimes people need to journal ahead of time because there's too much going on in there. And to yes. ask your brain to be quiet when you're, you know, sitting in a meditation would be quite, quite the task. Um, yeah. So finding that, that process, and there's a million different types of meditation. There's guided meditation. There's meditation on a focal point. There's meditation where you're, you know, visualizing something for your future, whatever it is that feels like you're, you're grounding yourself. You're not adding any kind of layers of stress, you know, that I'm yeah. not meditating well is, is right. something I hear a lot of the, I can't meditate. I'm really bad at meditating. There's no bad meditation. It's just what feels good to you. So right. I always like to have that as kind of a broad thing for people to be, you know, fit this in where it feels like a nice, relaxing thing for your mind and your brain. And it helps yeah. you get back to the present moment where right. there's likely not huge amount of stress. There's a huge amount of stress in our brains when we think about the future and the past. But when yeah. we're in this present moment, our brains can go, you're right. There's not a lot going on right now. Yes. Whatever so kind of helps you filter your brain into like, I'm right here. Yes. That's, that's the meditation for you. I think a lot of people, a lot of leaders also, they, they tend to carry a lot on their shoulders and Absolutely. they, you know, and I also found a lot of leaders also feel like, you know, they have to do everything themselves, that no one else is going to be able to do the job right if they don't do it themselves instead of delegating it to competent people that they know can do it, but yeah. they, in their head, they're, they're afraid to because they, ha or they might have a certain way of doing things. The other person might have a different way of doing things, but in the end result, they're, pro they're both going to get the same result. It's just changing the mindset of the leader and letting the leader delegate responsibilities to other people in the office and being able to have less stress in their lives be and then more time so they can focus on other things and, you know, help improve the business, I think. What is your intake on that? Absolutely. I, I think as leaders, there's such a pressure to do it right, but that right is your way. Um, and there's no judgment on that. It's just saying that, you know, likely you trust yourself, which is fantastic. But this putting everything on your shoulders and saying, no, that person, you know, they could do it 80% of the way and do a really, really good job. I better just do it. It's easier if I do it. This is a lie that we tell ourselves. Um, and it's, you know, a really fast way to burn out to be totally mm -hmm. honest. And the, yeah. you know, it's going to be a practicing principle of delegating and yeah. knowing that when you're delegating, consciously delegating things that are things other people can do, not things that you only you can do is right. being aware there that you will have a backlash of anxiety, giving yeah. it away and just being present with yourself and saying, you know, it's a really okay that I feel anxiety about de delegating this because I know that it's so important for my mental health yeah. to be able to give this piece away and just focus on the things that, um, that only I can do. Um, yeah. And I would also say that for, for leaders, it's incredibly important, you know, especially if you want to be improving your conflict patterns is regular breaks and, um, you know, high, highly driven people, people who have a lot of things on their on their plate, you know, we get that kind of like that in between I'm exhausted, but I also feel like maybe if I just worked a little bit more that I would not feel yeah. so anxious. And it's a trap because the more tired yeah. we get, the more anxious we feel. So we work some more and it's that almost creating in your calendar. I will not be working, you know, these days and allowing right. your brain to come offline for 24 to 48 hours. Say every weekend, you're going to take every weekend off every holiday and maybe a week of vacation that you are not going to work. You're not going to check email. You're not going to do anything that you'll see that you'll kind of get this spike of anxiety and yeah. then, Oh my gosh, I am so exhausted. So, right. so it being that really trying to protect that, um, that store of energy that you have by delegating and by taking these regular breaks, um, you will have anxiety and just be ready for it. 
um, but your body and your brain and your state, they will all thank you for being more rested, more grounded in that there's life outside of work. There's life outside of these interactions. There's life outside of leading this team. Um, and you're, and you're going to feel more prepared for these leadership moments that come at you that you need to respond and not react to if you're not feeling burned out. Right. Exactly. One of the things I hear from a lot of leaders also, they're like, I don't have time to take breaks. I don't have, you know, I'm busy. I can't, I can't stop, you know, and the, they end up being so stressed at the end of the day and, and they bring that stress home and then their family is affected, you know, and, and it just, you know, overall it, it hurts their mental health. And, you know, really? when you hurt your mental health, you hurt your physical health, you know, and, and oh, absolutely. I don't, I don't know the exact phrasing, but it's something to the effect of take a break or your body will make you and it will not be at a convenient time, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and for those people who feel like I truly cannot take a break and, and I totally get that. And, um, you know, I've been there too, where I feel like there's no way that I can stop. All these plates are going to fall and yeah. I'm going to feel, I feel so much anxiety if I pause for even a second, but I yeah. would advise and say, okay, Let's say you're not going to take the whole evening off. Could you take 15 minutes or you right. could you take 10 minutes off? Whatever amount of time that you can take off, and that, that's your time and it's sacred. Yeah. You're not checking email. You're not thinking about work. You're doing what you love, reading a book, going for a walk, hanging with your kids, playing video games. I don't care. Watching, watching Bravo TV or Love Island and eating snacks. Whatever mm -hmm. it is that makes you feel like you are, you know, getting a break, do that for a short period of time. And then you can go back to work if you need to, but, right. um, starting to, you know, get that little pocket of time and then expand it as you're able to get that anxiety to feel less crushing when you take a break. Cause right. really that's what it is. Anxiety is driving our, our push to keep working. And so yeah. it's trying to get more pockets where anxiety is not feeling overwhelming when we right. take a break. A hundred percent. I feel it's so important that, you know, people take breaks and, and I see so many people, you know, that want their one problem is that they don't take breaks and, you know, it catches up with them and not Absolutely. having in your life can cause so much chaos in so many different areas of your life. I feel. Absolutely. And I feel like we, we will push those breaks off with the thought like, Oh, if I just get past this, Yes. then I can take a break. If I just get past this project, this, you know, particularly, you know, crunchy situation at work, whatever it is, oh, just get past tax season or, you yeah. know, I, I tease myself that I can always be, you know, the person like, I just got to get through August. I just got to get through September and yeah. then I'll take that break and it'll slow down. That's not how life is going to be. It, we have to be building in the pockets, even if life is chaotic. Um, cause like I said, if you don't take a break, your body will take it for you and it will not be convenient. So. Yes. It's so true. It's so true. 70% of illnesses are caused by stress, you know, and mm -hmm. people don't realize that. And a lot of times Absolutely. when people are working it and they're overdoing it and they're, they're, they're being too much of a leader where they're putting too much of their energy and they're not taking care of themselves, you know, your the walls of your immune system just break down and then you're just Absolutely. basically over the doors to any kind of illness or any kind of disease to just make its way into your body and it's it, and it happens to so many people all the time absolutely it's it's so important to be building that resilience and that is the only way we can do that is by breaks um, yeah and prioritizing it too and, and being kind to ourselves you know yeah you're going to feel anxiety when you start taking that break. That's okay. Let's let that anxiety be there. Uh, yeah. It's just trying to protect you, but we're going to just set it aside just for a minute. Anxiety will be back with you in, in one hour. Right. And, you know, being yes. able to build that kind of um, not immunity to anxiety, but at least tolerance for feeling anxious and knowing what it is. And that comes again with that mindfulness, being able right. to build in time for being aware of what's going on in your head and that that is not you. Those thoughts are not you. So anxious thoughts can come in. I'm not doing enough. I need to figure this out. I can't take a break till this is. And you can look at them and say, you know what? 
we can still take this break. I see exactly. your thoughts. And I'm going to have you take a pause for a minute. Mm -hmm. We're going to just rest. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think too, like I've seen companies where they implement the breaks, like they, you know, they'll have like oxygen tanks or they'll have different things mm -hmm. in the office where people can utilize things to just like relax besides taking your 15 or a half an hour break or your hour break. You know, they have different things for their employees so they could actually during the day, if they're starting to feel stressed and they're starting to, you know, really feel overwhelmed, they can do certain things that will help them get back on track. Absolutely. And what a smart way to help everybody get into kind of problem solving mode too. There's nothing like banging your head against a computer trying to figure out a problem. Um, yeah. And then, you know, go take a break and the, the solution's right there. So right. Um, that's the other benefit of giving ourselves a break is if we can add a little bit of creativity to it, you know, um, even, you know, walking outside in nature or say doing something creative like music or art or, or dance or whatever it is, getting yeah. our right brain online, that will help us solve problems no matter what. There's yes. all those studies that say, you know, as soon as we're not thinking about it anymore, you know, the solution will come up you, like that classic example of you're really working on something, but now you're in the shower and you're like, oh my gosh, I just yeah. figured out the solution. It's like, it's again, that combination of being relaxed and not putting pressure on yourself and, um, and the solution is right there. So what a smart way of helping your team. Um, not only with their stress and helping with burnout, but also helping with their problem solving by creating spaces where it can be breaks. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Now, if, if you had to like really think about like different strategies and tools, like what are some of the things that you'd like to emphasize that you think would help with transformative leadership and making people to really turn into good leaders and really have good communication and good you know, ability to work with their team and really have constructive and positive success? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm going to be a broken record and I'm going to just emphasize the individual and self-awareness, yeah. you know, so um, get into some kind of tool or even if it's just that you're a really good journal or really start journaling um, and working on who am I, what are my strengths and weaknesses, how do I become activated in conflict, if you can even do it kind of a post-mortem on a conflict and yeah. say, hey, this is kind of what was going on, this is what I was feeling that kind of like self-awareness that you gain from, from really digging into how you're reacting to life will help you show up better moving forward. So um, mm -hmm. of course, I love the Enneagram because it's kind of a shortcut for people to say, hey, you know, this is your type. These are the areas that you're going to be potentially struggling in. And you could just start working on those areas. Um, yeah. But if you're not into the Enneagram, you can also just look at your life and say, hey, these are the areas I really, really struggle and start yeah. digging into those and figuring out the why behind everything. And then starting to figure out what do you need to operate at yeah. a higher level um, and really start taking those steps for you. You know, there's a lot of types in the Enneagram. They need a lot of space and there's nothing wrong with that. So get the space and structure your um, interactions with your team that allow you to recharge so that yeah. you can show up the best way that you can. So, you know, figuring out how you show up in kind of the negative way, but also figuring out the ways that help you operate the best. Um, right. And then also that really taking care of yourself um, as a leader to prevent things like burnout, um, that will help you show up even better for your team. Right. Oh, I, I, I agree totally with you. Now you wrote a book. Um, mm -hmm. Now tell me a little about the book that you wrote. Cause I'm really excited about it. Cause I was looking at it. It looks great. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a book that is a, um, you know, it's kind of a reference guide for the Enneagram. And I wrote it with the idea that, um, you know, as a, as a leader, as somebody who is with the team day in and day out and problem solving and having interactions this is a great reference tool for you to be able to say, hey, in this weird interaction with this other person, and I know that this is their type. And I figure when I'm reading theirs and I'm reading mine, that this is might be where the rub is. This is where we're, 
really not interacting in a way that is positive. And how can I move forward with either conversations if I need to have them or interactions that I'm definitely going to need to have later? How can I do that in a way that's positive for both of us? So a lot of times I feel like conflict can come down to misunderstanding, you know, just two people, you know, communicating on two different uh, wavelengths. That's because the that is how they were made and that's how they're born. Um, right. And we're just misunderstanding things because we're seeing their interaction through our eyes. If I interacted with someone that way, this is how I would be feeling. And that's not correct. They're interacting with you from their perspective. Um, and they could be totally okay with the situation where we're seeing it as conflict. So it's a great reference for that. It also, um, talks a lot about different types interacting with each other and, and where they can go wrong. So yeah. if two types are interacting and one type is giving too much advice, you know, the other type could really see that as a dig on their competence and, yeah. you know, just ways that you can be aware of how you can be triggering other people as well as them right. triggering you. Mm-hmm. I love it. Now, where can people find the book? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find my book on Amazon. Um, it's Enneagram in the Workplace and Kimberly Collins, the author. So it's an easy search, um, easy search there. Mm-hmm. Now, what are some of the services you provide? Because you provide quite a few services. Can you tell us a little about the services that you provide? Absolutely. So I'm a, a coach, so I can coach individuals, um, especially leaders. That's a great place that, you know, we talk a lot about burnout. Those leaders, they can use a lot more support and encouragement Um, a place to kind of springboard as well as work on things that can help them prevent burnout, improve their communication or improve the way that they deal with conflict. So I do a lot of coaching individually with uh, business owners and leaders, but I can also work with the team. And that would be either in like a teaching capacity, talking about the Enneagram and how that, how that works with the people in their lives. You know, what is the Enneagram? How can this benefit you? But there can be also group coaching as well. So um, getting a small team together and coaching the group, um, especially if it's, you know, one of your key teams or a team that has a lot of conflict, that can be a really fruitful place to improve the productivity and, you know, harmony of that team is having them all get to know each other a little bit and talk about certain um, goals that you have for that team. Right. Right. I love it. I love it. Now, where can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a website. It's um, EnneagramReflections.com. And there's all my services on there. You can buy my book on there as well. Um, And then there's lots of contact information. So if you're interested in getting more information about either um, leadership coaching or um, with your team consulting or coaching or whatever it is that you're looking for, you can find information about that on my website. I love it. I love it. This has been amazing. I think, you know, this is such an important topic because it could be applied in so many different ways. It could even be applied in your personal life too. a lot of these tactics, you know, so it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's great for leaders, but it's also great, you know, when you're at home, you know, or you're in other relationships and and you're trying to communicate with others to take these strategies and really apply Mm -hmm. them to your own life and, and situations that are going on in your life. Because I think it could really benefit you in all areas of your life, you know, but, you know, not just leaders. Oh, absolutely. You know, the idea being that these, you know, these things we're talking specifically about the workplace, but if we open up the term leadership to be anybody who's really in the the place of influencing somebody else, we're talking about coaches and parents and um, couples, and we're talking about siblings or family units Um, leadership or improving yourself through self-awareness and improving your emotional intelligence, that will just improve your relationships in general. It doesn't have to just be in the workplace. Right. This has been amazing. You know, I thank you so much, Kim, for coming on the show today. This has been an amazing conversation because I think everything that you you share today is so useful and and it it could be such a help in in today's society, you know, whether it's at work and, and you're a leader or, you know, working with your coworkers and working with your employees, you know, even utilizing some of these tactics at home or, you know, in other jobs, like you said, with influence, 
you know, that has to do with influence. It, it's, it's such a great, you know, um, great book and great resource to have, to be able to mm -hmm. communicate the right way. So people look at you more as a mentor and they look at you more in a positive aspect than trying to be a controller and, you know, absolutely. and take control of the situation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's the goal of any leader is not to be the person in control, but the person who is forging the way forward with people who are willingly following you. Exactly. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Kim, for coming yeah. on the show. I really appreciate today's session. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day. Yeah, you too.